Thank you, team. It's so good to be worshipping together in uh, such a loud room, coming to God together, knowing his presence with us, knowing him speaking clearly to us, and really clearly inviting us to, to come into his presence, to bring our whole selves to him. Um, and, and we're going to continue doing that this morning by uh, drawing our attention to God through his word and through uh, hearing his voice uh, through it. And, and so if you don't know me, my name is uh, Simon. I'm one of the pastors here at Ascot Life Church. And uh, for the past uh, several months, really, uh, we've been working through the letter of 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, uh, which is a letter written by a man named Paul, who was one of the first leaders uh, in the early Christian movement. And in this letter, he's writing to a church in the Greek city of Corinth, uh, who are having uh, quite a number of problems that he's writing to address. Uh, And usually, um, when I teach on this part of the Bible, and really any part of the Bible, uh, I like to set aside a few minutes at the beginning of the message to explain uh, how this ancient book is relevant to our 21st century lives today. But I actually don't think I have to do that this morning, uh, because The topics Paul's going to address here in this passage are some of the most hotly debated in our world today. Because in this passage, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul is going to speak to us about gender, gender identity, uh, gender confusion, and even more broadly, the relationship between men and women. And so we need to acknowledge right at the beginning this morning, that this is a sensitive subject to be dealing with as a church. Um, It's one that has caused uh, some division amongst Christians, and it's one that has also really sadly caused, at the personal level, it may have even caused you frustration or confusion uh, or or even pain. Um, And I want to say right up the front, I am under no illusions that a 30-minute message can speak into all of that and address like the whole complexity of this topic. All I'm really going to be able to do this morning is just explain what I feel God is saying through this uh, particular passage. And I, I hope that it will really stir and prompt new conversations for us as a church. But saying that, whilst this is a complex topic, uh, it is, of course, best for us to start that conversation with the Bible and with what God says here. Because we, as a church, believe that this book is God's word and we believe that what it says of itself is true, namely that it is a lamp to our feet. Meaning that when we find ourselves in times of darkness, either uh, you know, darkness in our minds and understanding or darkness in our experience, this book has the power to shed light on that. And actually, as I've been studying this passage and really wrestling with it and looking at vastly different opinions on what this says and kind of talking this through with wise men and women in my life, I have come to quite an excited conviction that actually God wants to shed a lot of light through this passage on us this morning. I believe he wants to bring light of clarity to us and kind of the light of liberty as we understand it. Now, I'm not saying... Um, I believe that as I teach on this passage, we're all going to kind of end up in 100% agreement on everything I say. Uh, As we said at the beginning, this is a a topic on which Christians, faithful, Bible-believing, Jesus-loving Christians do come to different opinions on. And that's okay. And so that means that as a church, uh, whilst as leaders we too take a certain view on this issue... It's not something we kind of legislate 100% you know, uniformity on. There is space for some differences of opinion here. And so, as I preach, I, I am going to preach the only way I know how, which is to tell you what I think the passage says. But if you kind of don't line up on you know, one or two things, or there's some kind of difference of opinion, you know, that is completely okay. Because the you know, point of preaching isn't to just make us all think exactly the same. It's for us to hear God's voice and God's heart. And actually, I believe, as we come to the end of the message, no matter where we end up on the specifics of this particular passage, actually, for all of us, if we know Jesus, there will be a call 
for us to heed together as a church. But I'm going to make you wait for that a little bit. So first, uh, I'm going to read the passage, um, and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to work through what God is saying to us through it. So 1 Corinthians 11 says this, I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the traditions just as I pass them on to you. But I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It's the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she might as well have her hair cut off. But if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut off or her head shaved, then she should cover her head. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. And it's for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her own head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it's her glory? For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. Let me pray. <laughs> Jesus, we know that you are such a good leader to us as a church, and we know that your word is good, and we ask as we work through it this morning that we would experience it as a lamp, lighting up our path and lighting up our darkness, and we pray that you would lead us so faithfully as a church through this passage this morning, so that we would end united, that we would end in worship to you, and that you would equip us for our mission together as we go forward. Amen. Okay, it's a passage with a lot of tricky bits and a lot of parts that we might well stumble over and have questions about. And let me just say at the front, we are going to hit every single tricky passage this morning. I'm not going to try and evade them. Uh, but before we get there, it will really help us to kind of use the whole passage to build up a picture of the situation that's going on here. So, what seems to be going on? Well, looking at verse 2... Paul begins this passage by praising the Corinthians for the first time in the letter for obeying some traditions that he passed on to them. And these seem to be traditions about how they worship together as a church. But there's one tradition that the Corinthians seem to be either ignoring or maybe just have some questions about. And it's a tradition regarding how men and women present themselves in worship, specifically how they present their hair or their heads in worship. Now, um, unfortunately, uh, it, it's actually pretty tricky to work out exactly what the issue is here in this passage. Paul could be talking about two things. He might be talking about how women should have their heads covered with like a veil and men shouldn't, or he's talking about how women should tie up their long hair and men should cut short their hair. The, the Greek language could go either way. We, we can't be certain about the exact issue here. But what we can be fairly certain about is the cultural significance attached to these different hairstyles. Uh, see, in the ancient world, as in many cultures around the world today still, the way you wore your hair it communicated a lot to other people. And specifically in ancient Corinth, the way you wore your hair communicated a lot, actually, about your sexual availability as a person. So uh, for a woman, 
in that culture to have long hair and exposed hair in public was a sign to other men that she was sexually available. Strange as it may seem, it was a different culture. And actually, to have her head shaved meant the same thing, because the only women you would see in ancient Corinth with shaved heads were those who worked in the temple as prostitutes. So that hair communicated sexual availability. And actually, on the same side, for a man to have long hair in that culture signaled his sexual availability to other men as well, in a, in a homosexual sense. Now, of course, that's different to our world today, but we have to kind of get into the world of the text to understand it. Those are the kind of cultural symbols at play here. And so it seems that Paul, when he planted churches, he gave them a kind of tradition or custom about how they're to worship. And he said, women, you are to tie up your hair or kind of cover it when you come to worship like the women of your day. And men, when you come to worship, you're to have your hair cut short like the men of your day. But it seems that the Corinthians were kind of having questions about this. And it's not hard to see why. Because the thing is, when Christianity exploded onto the scene in the Roman Empire, it was absolutely revolutionary when it came to gender. So in the ancient world, uh, genders were almost always segregated. Men almost always spent time with women, uh, with men, <laughs> and women almost always spent time with women. And that was particularly the case in religious life. They would not worship together in temples. But then when Jesus arrived, he upended all of that. He called followers to himself who were men and women. When churches were planted in his name, men and women worshipped side by side. Even as Paul says, they're both praying and prophesying in a meeting. And Paul, in other letters, also wrote crazy things for his day, saying things like, in Christ there is no male or female, you're all one in Christ Jesus. You're equal before God. And of course, to us, that's like, <laughs> of course, common sense. In those, that, that was radical. In fact, we owe a lot of our culture's sense of gender equality to the Bible and to Christianity. It was something Christianity brought to the Roman world. And so it seems that on the back of that, the Corinthians in this church were thinking, hang on, why are we still observing this tradition of men and women dressing differently in worship? You know, hasn't Jesus done away with gender? You know, isn't that a thing? Aren't we all one in Christ? Why are we still observing? Isn't that something of the past that we kind of have these distinctions? But in response to that, Paul says something hugely significant to them about men and women, which was significant then and I believe is also significant now for us as a church in 21st century Ascot. And this is it. This is the big point I believe Paul is making in this passage. Paul is saying this. But when the church comes to worship, men and women should be visible because when the church does mission, men and women are both vital. I'll repeat it because I think that's a big point Paul is making here. Men and women should be visible in the church's worship because men and women are both vital for the church's mission. And that's where we're going to finish and apply. But Paul develops this point uh, in three ways. By showing us that men and women are demonstrators, that we are distinct, and that we're dependent on one another. So we're just going to work through these kind of three steps in the passage and then going to consider how this applies to us as a church. So the first thing Paul wants the Corinthians to know is that it's important that they worship together as men and women because in this way they are demonstrators of something bigger than themselves. And this is where we come to our first kind of tricky passage in this text. So, verse 3, Paul says this. He says, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. There's, of course, a lot we could draw out of that passage, but I guess it's the middle phrase that kind of trips us up, that the head of the woman is man. So what's Paul saying there? Well, First thing to realize uh, is that Paul is very clearly not saying that the head of every woman is every man. The language, even in our English translations, makes that very clear. He says the head of the woman 
is man. And so it's actually probably better to translate this verse uh, not as about women and men, but more specifically about wives and husbands. Because uh, in the Greek language, uh, and as in many ancient languages, the words for wife and woman and man and husband were interchangeable. Because in the ancient culture, you know, if you were a man or a woman, you were most likely married. So they only had one word for both. And so, of course, that's not true for us today, and so we have to be careful not to over-apply this. When Paul's talking about headship here, it seems to be specifically located in marriage. He's saying the head of the wife is her husband. But still, we, we've got questions about that. What, what does Paul mean by that? And actually, as Christians have interpreted this, there have been actually three main interpretations of what Paul means by head here. And you know me. You know that I would love to spend the next hour going through the pros and cons and the fors and against of each argument, but if I did that, the kids' workers would be really annoyed at me. So uh, I'm going to have to be brief here, and if you want to you know, talk about this afterwards or at you know, some point during the week, I would love to. Uh, but just to be brief, uh, one way Christians have interpreted this is that Paul is talking about headship here as being about authority. That Paul is saying... A husband is the head of the wife, meaning that he's in charge of her. Like the head of a department is in charge of their subordinates. So this is about authority in the marriage relationship. Uh, But whilst that might be the way we use the language of heads today, I don't think it's appropriate here. And there's many reasons for that. But one, just from this passage, is that Paul nowhere again talks about God, Christ, or the husband having authority over those that they're heads of. In fact, the only time authority comes up in this passage is in verse 10, when Paul is talking about the wife taking authority over her own head. So authority doesn't quite seem to be the sense of the word here. And so in response to that, some people have said, well, this isn't about authority, but this is about actually source or origin. Paul is saying that the husband is the head of the wife in the way that the head of a river is the source for all the water that flows from it. And this interpretation does make sense of what Paul says later in the passage. Because in verse 8, Paul says, Woman wasn't made from man. Sorry, Paul says, Man wasn't made from woman, but woman came from man. And he's, of course, referring to Genesis 2, when Eve, the first woman, came from the side of Adam, the first man. He was her source in that way. But there are a few problems with that interpretation. Another from this passage being that in verse 12, Paul says both that woman came from man and also that man came from woman. So they're both the source of one another, and yet... Uh, only, he says, the husband is the head of the wife. So the source thing, whilst it might be part of it, I don't think that can serve as the full picture either. And so, cutting this very short again, I I think the third interpretation is actually, I think, the one that has the best reasons for it. And that's that headship isn't about authority over, nor is it about source, but it's about caring responsibility. It's about responsibility for, of a husband for the care of his wife. And I think that's the best interpretation for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because I think that's how ancient Corinthian readers would have read this language. Because in the ancient world, as again in many cultures today, the head of a household is the one who is responsible for the care of their family. They're responsible for kind of uh, their public reputation and representing them in public settings, and they're also responsible for the kind of provision and care of their family. But even more importantly than that, I think this idea of headship being about caring responsibility, it makes more sense of how Paul uses this language elsewhere in the Bible. Because in Ephesians 5, there's another letter where Paul talks about Husbands being the heads of their wives. And he compares it to how Christ is the head of his church, us. And when you think about Jesus' relationship to the church, 
What does it look like? Well, in Ephesians 5, it doesn't look like domineering authority. Nor does it simply look like Jesus being kind of like the source of the church. So that might be part of it. But what it looks like is Jesus showing caring, sacrificial responsibility for his bride. So it says that he washes us with water by the word. It says that he nourishes us as his own body. It even says he lays down his life to provide life for us. And although there are, of course, Paul is still aware, very vast differences between Christ and the church and a man and woman's relationship, I think it's this sense of caring responsibility that Paul sees as the common thread. When he talks about a husband being ahead of the wife, it's about him having responsibility to care for her. Now, we need to be careful there not to interpret from that that the Bible is therefore implying kind of certain roles that husbands and wives should take in marriage. Because the Bible never goes as far as to say, you know, who should be the breadwinner, who should uh, look after the children, who should do the housework. The Bible never goes into specifics, I think because a healthy marriage can look vastly different from marriage to marriage and from culture to culture. And in fact, if you look at Ephesians 5, Jesus is the one who, who does the, in that culture, the stereotypically feminine things in washing uh, and so I don't think Paul is at all in, like, uh, stereotyping there. Instead, the, the thread seems to be that a marriage is to be a reflection of the gospel. That in the, the way that a husband cares for his wife, puts her first, sacrifices himself for her, and the, the way that a wife reciprocates with love and loyalty, that is to be a picture of Jesus' love and the church's love for one another. Paul is saying, as men and women, if we're married, we're demonstrators of a much bigger, much lovelier story. And the reason he's saying all this, to come back to the Corinthians, he's saying all this because he says, if this is true, if you are demonstrators, then when you come to worship, it matters how you look. It matters how you present yourselves, because you're not there just as an isolated agent. You're there as a demonstrator, an actor, almost. And so he says in verses 4 and 5 to the men and the women, he says, firstly to the men, when you come to worship, you should not present your hair in such a way that says you're sexually available and and kind of breaking with your marriage bond. Why? That dishonors Christ. He's called you to be a loving carer for your wife. And in the same way, in verse 5, Paul says to women, you too shouldn't wear your hair in such a way which connotes sexual availability because that dishonors your husband who Christ has joined you to in love. This is Paul talking about how we're demonstrators when we come to worship. He says, because you're demonstrating a bigger story, you should consider how you present yourselves, what you're telling to the world around you. And of course, as we apply this in our day, that will look vastly different. Because, you know, the way we wear our hair doesn't communicate at all what it communicated back then. And so if I turn up to worship next week with kind of long flowing locks... (laughs) I don't think you'll be concerned for my marriage. You'd be concerned about a few other things. uh, But you wouldn't be concerned for mine and Liz's relationship. By the same token, though, if I turned up next week and took off my wedding ring and wasn't sitting with a Liz and was maybe wearing some provocative clothing, I'd hope you... Sorry to put that image in your minds. Erase that. Cut that from the recording. If I did that, you would be concerned, wouldn't you? And it's not because I'm doing anything sinful or because I've been literally unfaithful to a Liz, but it's like when I'm coming to... I'm not telling the right story. I'm a husband to show Christ's love for his church, and I'm not telling that story. Let's move on, because we need to get that image out of your mind. So Paul is saying, for the first, first reason that he wants the church to be visible as men and women is because we demonstrate something. Well, of course, this part of the passage is more specific to married men and women, and that's not the case for all of us. So we do have to move on to the second point, which is where Paul says, another reason we're to be visible as men and women when we worship is because we're distinct. We are distinct genders and beings. And this is where we come to another problem or tricky text. Uh, In verse 7, Paul says this, he says, A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. 
but woman is the glory of man. Now that's tricky, not because of the first bit. You know, we, if we read Genesis, know that humans are created in the image of God to reflect his goodness. And so Paul says again to the men, if you're wearing your hair in a way that doesn't reflect his goodness, that's wrong. You should not do that. You're meant to reflect God's goodness to the world around you. Then the tricky bit is the last bit, where Paul says, woman is the glory of man. What's going on here? Well, again, first, we need to realize that Paul is not here denying that women are also the image and glory of God. Why? Because Genesis 1 makes it very clear that men and women both created in the image and likeness of God and both have that representative call on our lives. And Paul, it's clear, has read Genesis because he bases his argument on it. So what Paul seems to be doing here is even more specifically considering what men and women's relationship are to each other. And in that context, he says, women are the glory of man. Again, what does that mean? Well, in the Bible, glory can mean what comes out of a person. So God's glory kind of shines out of him. And even more specifically, something's, or someone's glory is something that comes out of them and brings delight to them and to others. So if you have your Bible open and you look at verse 15, you'll see that Paul calls a woman's long hair her glory, meaning it has come out of her, very literally, and it brings delight to her and others. Or if we go to 1 Thessalonians, which I think we've got on the slides, Paul talks to a church that he's planted, and he says to them, you are our glory and joy. Meaning what? Meaning that they came out of him. You came out of our labors. And secondly, that you bring delight to us. You're our glory. We glory in you. We delight in you. So glory is something which comes out of someone and brings delight to them and others. And I think that's what Paul means when he says women is the glory of man here. Because that's what he explains in verses 8 and 9. So we just look firstly at verse 8. Paul says, man did not come from woman but woman from man. So like the glory of God coming out, it, the woman literally came out of man because God built woman from the side of Adam. And then if we read on in verse 9, Paul says, and neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Now, it's another tricky passage. I think that, that sounds pretty subordinationist or, or what's going on there. But if we go back to Genesis 2, I think it becomes a lot clearer. Because what we see there is that woman was made for man as his helper. But if you go into the Hebrew and look at what the word helper means, it does not mean like inferior assistant. It actually means something huge. It means source of strength, source of needed strength. And the person in the Bible most often called people's helper is God who is never anyone's inferior. Helper means something like ally or or even like saviour, one who brings strength to a helpless individual. And that's what the the narrative in Genesis paints woman as. It's one who has come from man with distinct gifts, which stop him from being helpless, just wandering in a garden, unable to do anything, but able to partner with him to bring beauty into the world. Did I say something? Okay. So, (laughs) you all think I'm talking about a Liz. And so, I think when Paul is talking about women being man's glory here, he's not saying that they're inferior. Not at all about that. Instead, it's about difference. He's saying women came from man and they bring delight. Why? Because they have distinct, unique gifts, which when they come together, bring about something beautiful. And of course, Paul is talking here in the context of marriage, but I think he's making this point more widely to speak to all men and women. He's saying this is the second reason why when you come to worship, you should look like men and look like women. It's because it's only as men and women that the full range of God's gifts are on display. And the church needs all of them. And so that's why he ends this part of the text in verse 10 saying, it is for this reason that a woman ought to have authority over her head. 
meaning this is why women should take authority and tie up their hair, he says it's because of the angels. You think, what? Well, Paul is saying here, when you come to worship, he's saying people are looking on. The world is looking on, but also spiritual powers are looking on. And when they look at the church, what should they see? They should not see gender confusion, nor should they see gender battles. They should see genders uniting. They should look on the church, and it should look like the garden, where man and woman partnering together, bringing life to the world. Paul says this is the second reason why men and women worship visibly together, because you're distinct and have distinct gifts that are needed. And then just lastly, this last point it is the shorter one, but it clarifies this. Paul says, not only are men and women distinct, but also that they are dependent on one another. And so in verses 11 and 12, Paul clarifies that he doesn't mean women and men are distinct, so they should kind of do separate things, but they should come together because they need each other. Verse 11 and 12, Paul says, Nevertheless, in the Lord, man, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. But as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. And after some tricky passages, I think this one's actually relatively easy to understand. Because it lines up with scripture. You know, Adam was uh, made by God and then he was the source of Eve. But then every man since was the source of a woman. It lines up with that. But it also lines up with just biology. (laughs) We know that Men, on their own, cannot produce life, nor can women. But together, they can produce life. And Paul says, what's true in biology is true in the kingdom. Men and women, on their own, cannot produce life. They cannot fulfill their calling to bring God's goodness to the world, but together they can. They can produce spiritual life, which brings blessing for many. And so Paul is saying here, there's no space for one gender to dominate church life and the other to be sidelined. No, no, both must be firing on all cylinders for the church to flourish. It says you're distinct and therefore you're dependent on one another. And so this is Paul's big point. He's saying to the Corinthians, when you come to worship, you must be visible as men and women because both men and women are vital for the mission. And as I said at the beginning, I think that was something the Corinthians really needed to hear. But I think still for us today, we need to get this. Because we as a church, we do have a vision to reach many with the gospel. We have a calling to to bring life to the world through telling people about Jesus, bringing the, the message to them. And we also feel we have callings to help support and strengthen new churches and maybe even plant others in the future. And here's what the Bible is saying to us. If we are to even take a step forward in that, we must have men and women fully active in that mission. And so just as we finish, I just want to, I could you know, apply this for hours, but I just want to highlight four very quick things in my last few minutes that I think will be key steps forward for us off the basis of this. Firstly, I, I think this passage tells us we need to continue raising up male and female leaders. As a church, we need more spiritual fathers, men who will be men of character and will give themselves sacrificially to caring for us as a church and guarding us from dangers, walls. We need spiritual fathers. That's what we mean when we talk about elders. Elders are just simply fathers of churches. But as a church, we also need spiritual mothers, Women of character and stature who, in their unique way, can bring about life in our church, can nurture and grow it, but also who, like Deborah in the Old Testament, the mother of Israel, can kind of lead and provoke us, call us to war, call us to action. We need mothers and fathers to flourish. We need to raise up, but secondly, we also need to team up more. Because even if we're not all mothers and fathers, all of us, according to the New Testament, are brothers and sisters, which means that like siblings in a family business, we need to be good at teaming up together, meaning we don't just leave some ministries for the men and some for the women because, you know, that's the way churches have always been. No, no, no. We need in every area of church life the full range of gifts on display because then they will flourish. Thirdly, I think we serve one another by speaking up. 
when we see us kind of falling short of this vision as a church. Because it is no secret that the church across history has not always got this right. And we'd be silly if we thought we were immune to that. And the way we will kind of continue forward on that vision is when we see areas of church life which are not living up to this vision, we don't just kind of keep it to ourselves, but we speak up. We share it. As Ephesians says, we speak the truth in love to one another and call us to more. And then just lastly, as the band come up, we need to continue looking up as a church. Because Jesus is the one who brings unity in the church. Paul says in verse 11, he says, In the Lord, man and woman are dependent on one another. Meaning, we can only be dependent on one another through what Jesus has done. But the reason Adam and Eve lost their wonderful unity and companionship in the garden was because they were cut off from God. They turned away from him and it caused a rupture between men and women. But Jesus, when he comes, he restores us to God and this also restores us to one another. So as we seek as a church to, uh, to bring life to the world through partnering together, we need Jesus as our leader to lead us forward in that. He's our ultimate leader. Men don't lead the church. Women don't lead the church. It's not even men and women leading the church. It's Jesus, our Savior, leading the church. And we need to come to him because we're dependent on him.